Hello, hello, hello. Yes, I'm so excited. And I am Stephen. Be warned, this episode may be heavily redacted. And a bit heartwarming and awesome and just everything in between because this setting is just full of so many horrific things with so many great things and the story of it just coming together is amazing. Oh, my apologies. Thank you, Suziggy. My, uh, my mic was, in fact, off. So... As I was saying before, I am Brandon, and um, this is uh, this episode is special entertainment procedures. Wow, what a goof! Yep, that was terrible. That was terrible. I was spent an entire like four minutes being inaudible. I'm amazing. Yes, ye. At any rate. Um, for anyone who might not be familiar with what in the world we're talking about when we talk about SCPs. Um, it all started with, uh, okay, every once in a while, the internet actually creates something. Usually that thing is either terrible or pornographic or both, see Bowsette for details, <laughs> but sometimes, sometimes they make something amazing. Oh yes, sometimes and they make things... This is one of those examples. Um, I'm going to link in the uh, I'm going to link in the chat here. SCP Just remember, Brandon, you're, you're going to have to link everything because I don't have link privileges. Uh, okay, yeah, I'll make sure I do that. Send me any send me any links that you need linked. Anyway, the link that I've just placed in the channel is the link to SCP-173, which began as a copy pasta, just something people would post on the paranormal board of 4chan of all fucking places. And it, well, it took off. And the reason it took off, well, it has several reasons it took off. First off, it's a really interesting, like, it's a different kind of um, format than you usually saw in random creepy stories on the internet. But also, it, well, it's item 173. The first item was item 173. That means there are at least 170 more, which means that anyone who wants to can start just making them. So that's what happened. And you go from just this tiny little SCP-173, isn't it adorable in its homicidal urges for a statue, up to, what are we on, 4,000? There are currently, yes, well over 4,000. Not quite enough to reach that meme status just yet, but that's impressive. Considering there will be over this, nine thousand, I think. Absolutely, but that's that's also impressive considering this was made predominantly by the internet. Right, and um, I keep hearing about some like political stuff. Not political. I mean, not political in the sense of like democracy but political in the sense of, like, the admins of the site and things that, like, some kind of weird... I don't know. I don't know anything about that. So, if anyone listening to this channel is, like, aware of that, just know that we're not talking about that. Because I don't know anything about it, and I'm just not interested in it. We are strictly here to talk about the lore and the items themselves on the SCP Foundation. Right, and the reason we're doing that mainly is because there's a lot of great 
um, there's a lot of great stuff in here. A lot of really terrible stuff, don't get me wrong. But there's a lot of great stuff in here that some of which can definitely improve your gameplay experience if you were to sneak it into, into your tabletop experience or, um, well, honestly, it's just a fun read. It really is. And also, just keep in mind, during this podcast, me and Brandon are going to be using a lot of terminology that some people might not be familiar with, i.e. mimetic kill agents, amnesty. Right, right, right. We're going to use a lot of words. Um, we're going to try to define all our buzzwords, but it's very difficult because a lot of the... I mean, this, this wiki is enormous and mostly self-contained, and after five or six articles, you will know what all these words mean, but... Which is mildly ironic because most of the items in the SCP are not self-contained. True. Um, oh god, there was something else I wanted to say about that. Oh, right. Um, another thing is that you'll notice that... And I don't know what exactly the story is with this, but... 173 is a very simple little article. It's a... It's just a self-contained, this is why, this is the thing, this is what we do to hold the thing, and that's all. Um, a lot of the early ones are like that, but as time has passed, the articles have tended toward getting longer. A lot of articles do tend, tend to get a bit longer, and some of them are quite short. Some of them are, might be shorter than 173's article, but by and large, you'll notice that the format is very reminiscent of any kind of um, what's the word I'm looking for here? I don't know. Official, what you're official, for. official documentation that you would find on um, uh, in any well, kind like of medical documentation. But I mean, well, medical documentation, government documents, things like that. Or at the very least, they try. They do not always succeed. So, let's dive right into it, shall we? I think we shall. Um, so, what do you want to talk about first? I mean, I think what we should do is just kind of give the overview. Like, we've talked about 173, but we haven't really covered why, what it is beyond people who, you know, people who aren't clicking on the links or so on and so Sure, sure, yeah, let's do that. So... We'll walk, yeah, we'll walk through this first article. That makes a lot of sense. So, again, this is SCP-173. This is the original. And, in fact, it is actually so short that I'm just going to do a dramatic reading. Oh, fun times. Item number, SCP-173. Object class, Euclid. Special Containment Procedures. Item SCP-173 is to be kept in a locked container at all times. When personnel must enter SCP-173's container, no fewer than three may enter at a time, and the door is to be relocked behind them. At all times, two persons must maintain direct eye contact with SCP-173 until all personnel have vacated and relocked the container. Description. Move to Site-19 in 1993. Origin is as yet unknown. It is constructed from concrete and rebar, with traces of Krylon brand spray paint. SCP-173 is animate and extremely hostile. The object cannot move while within direct line of sight. Line of sight must not be broken at any time. With SCP-173. Personnel assigned to enter container are instructed to alert one another before blinking. Object is reported to attack by snapping the neck at the base of the skull or by strangulation. In the event of an attack, personnel are to observe class 4 hazardous object containment procedures. Personnel report sounds of scraping stone originating from within the container when no one is present inside. This is considered normal, and any change in this behavior should be reported to the acting HMCL supervisor on duty. The reddish-brown substance on the floor is a combination of feces and blood. Origin of these materials is unknown. The enclosure must be cleaned on a bi-weekly basis. 
And as such, this is the object that launched thousands of articles and I don't even know how many pieces of prose and other lore that exists on the site. It's thousands upon thousands of articles and words, and it's just it's just a thing of beauty. That it is. Um, the the interesting thing to me about one seven three, right? As I as I as I reread the article just now, it's that it's really or the uh, the language is really unrefined like they're going for that clinical um they're going for that clinical kind of scientific documentation feeling but they really 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 didn't get there but it's still one probably one of the better written pieces there are some out there that are not very good but there are just as many that are infinitely better well, I would argue. I would argue that. I mean, it's early. It's early. Uh, early iteration weirdness is what it is. But, um, yeah. so I want to talk about a couple of things related to, related to what we just read because, the, the first thing, is. That. This is this object is also where the object classes, the containment classes, actually came into being, or at least one of them. And at at the time, it's not clear that even the author of this article knew where knew what Euclid meant. I assume they didn't. I'm sure they found the word and utilized it to the best of their description capabilities. Right, but more or less. The refined, the refined definition of the object classes that doesn't come till much. Right. So at any rate, the the current the current. Uh, object classes, or there are about a dozen of, or there actually I think there are close to thirty of them. But the only one, or the ones that matter, the ones that get used a lot, are safe, Euclid, Keter, Keter, Keter. I'm gonna go with Keter, and well, technically Thaumiel and Apollyon. Those are very rare, but they are like officially part of the canon. And the way you tell which one's which is called the box test. I'll note that by the standards of the SCP Foundation, a nuclear bomb is considered safe. It's considered safe... Let, let that sink in for a second. A nuke is considered safe to these people. Right. And the reason it's considered safe is because if you put it in a box and you don't mess with it, it will not do anything. That's true of all safe objects. If you put them in a box and you leave them alone, nothing will happen. Euclid objects are less well understood, generally, and you can't just put them in a box and nothing will happen. You have to take active measures. You have to, for example, clean their cage while staring directly at them, otherwise it will tear your head off. Easy peasy. So if you put it in a box and you don't really know what'll happen, so you have to take active measures to contain it, that's Euclid. If, when you put it in a box and do nothing, all hell breaks loose, that's Keter. And my god, some of the Ketters are glorious. They are indeed delightful. Note again that this is not this is not based on their ability to destroy things, and it's not based on the danger they pose. It's based on how difficult it is to keep them in a box. And then, of course, the other two, if the object is a box, that's a thaumiel, and if the object can't be put in a box, that's an apollyon. Another way to look at apollyon is, by the very nature of an apollyon, boxes do not exist. Right. You There is no box you can contain it with. It's just not containable. Which generally means bad news for everyone. I should note that in the canon of the SCP, um, the plural of apocalypse is a necessary thing to know. Oh yes, there's more than one, kids. Buckle up. Yes, indeed. So, that's basically how it works. And the interesting... 
one of the, the interesting thing about SCP to me is that because there are so many writers, there are like infinite different varieties of articles, and some of them will appeal to you, and some of them will not, but they're all different. An example I'm going to give is the good old SCP-55. Oh, 55. 55. So, Object 55 is, they call it Keter, but they don't know what it is. They have no idea. They don't know what it looks like. They don't know what it does, if anything. They don't know how they got it, where it came from. No clue. No clue at all. And the reason for that is because Object 55 is something you can't remember. That's all. Just something you can't remember. It's not I round, whatever it is. I love the description of it being described as a self-keeping secret or an anti-meme. Right. Information about SCP-55's physical appearance as well as its nature, behavior, and origins is self-classifying. In other words, they can't know what this thing is or how they got it or why it's contained the way it is or whether it's actually killing people left and right. They have no idea. No clue. As such, going back, like we said, this is classified as a Keter, or I prefer the term Keter, so we're going to be flip-flopping flopping back and forth, and those of you who have trouble telling us apart, it might sound a bit strange, but... Uh, uh, we're the same person, it'll be fine. Pretty much. But anybody, uh, have you? did you by chance link this? I haven't looked at the Twitch. Oh, no, I didn't link 55. I'll go ahead and do it. Should go ahead and link 55, and while you're while he's doing that, I'll kind of go over it. If you, as you look at the article, you'll notice that it has a the writing has taken on a bit more of a clinical nature to it. It's describing uh, things more along the lines you'd find in scientific documentation, as in the containment procedure. Object is kept within a five by five by two point five meter square room constructed of cement, and it's, it's using meters, and it's using meters. It's using meters, and you'll notice in the documentation of it, if you're actually looking at it like the rest of us losers, it has the uh, number written out as well as the actual numeric symbol for it. Just kind of falling in line with what you might find in any kind of documentation of that. Right, although it, it does get a little bit unprofessional in the description section, but that's it's getting... They're finding as they... Okay, so 55 is one of the later objects. And as they've gone on, they kind of find, they've kind of found a voice for these things that's somewhere in between properly clinical and a narrative. And where we get into the actual narrative description of things is where I really bought into the foundation, the SCP lore. Uh-huh. As you look down the page, you get the various... You get the addendum... Uh, as an addendum, a, hey, if this thing is really an anti-meme, why doesn't the fact that it's an anti-meme get wiped? We must be wrong about that somehow. Wait a minute. What if we were to keep notes about what it isn't? Would we remember those? Bartholomew, Bar bleh, Bartholomew Hughes in S. Right. So, now, on top of having a dangerous object, we have a character. Kind of. A a, a person speaking in their own voice who never appears again uh, except for down below in the transcript but this is not a recurring character it's just a, there's now a character in this article and there's a bit of a narrative that happens where you know they he proves that you can in fact remember that Object 55 exists as long as you know what it's not or refer to it simply as a number, i.e. SCP-055. So, and I, I And I really like the articles that bring on the narratives and the, you know, the addendums and everything that men makes mention of the people studying the object because it gives you a human connection to this object. Now, that said, I actually kind of preferred the simpler articles that had very little of that. You could have some of it, 
but I want to know more about the behavior of the thing that doesn't make sense than I want to know about the behavior of the researchers researching the thing that doesn't make sense. You know what I mean? Well, right, but then you get into um, you get into interesting territory when you approach objects like uh, the plague. Sure. And that's actually an interesting one because that one has been rewritten recently. With uh, recordings of the transcript recorded by, um, uh, I believe it's the Volgan on YouTube who does it. He does yep. a and fantastic the job. Abs- the Volgan is all absolutely awesome. We're going to make reference to a lot of things. Volgan is one of the people on YouTube who does uh, occasionally does recordings of uh, SCP um, items and lore and other things. Just a dramatic reading. Yeah. And um, there's actually a few good YouTubers for this. So there's the Vulgan, uh, the Exploring Series, East Side Show. East Side Show is one, the one that I first started listening to after you told me about these guys. Um, SCP Illustrated. There are like many YouTube channels that um, that talk about these things. Not to mention SCP After Dark, a pseudo podcast that kind of fits within the lore. Um, kind of a pirate radio station that is produced by who? Would, uh... I bet it's the damn chaos at surgery. On site, um, it's an on site um, official des- on site official radio service that basically pipes its music and um, everything out to the various sites and so on and so forth. Okay, would you go ahead and link that to me? Because I've never heard of this one. Yeah, I'll link you the pilot real quick. 20, I believe the original I believe the original creator is actually Toad King 07. Um, and he's actually listed on SCP Foundation Wiki. All the episodes are brought up on there as well documented but um yeah he it, it's fantastically fun it tells its own little narrative story that fits within that particular realities variation variation of the scp foundation oh that's probably an important thing to note uh there is no canon but there is a canon i mean there is but like there isn't really like Pretty much everything that is directly said in an SCP article is probably canon, but what that what that means and how it comes together that's really just that's really just up to you. You can do it however you like, which is useful if you're going to use it in your own games and things, which you absolutely can do. Um, I'm pretty sure the whole thing is available under Creative Commons. It's somewhere on the site. I'd have it to is look. Somewhere on the site, but. The point is, if you want to use this stuff, you absolutely can, and you don't have to be limited to the way they, or the way other people think about the canon. That's all. This is, I think just looking at the SCP Foundation site, it's just a glorious, I'd say case study, but not really, just a glorious example of the communal instincts of the internet. The communal ability of the internet to occasionally actually accomplish something, yeah. It's a shining example of that. Oh, it is in fact Creative Commons, yeah. Well, sweet. That answers that question. And the actual uh, yeah, the actual designation of the SCP radio is SCP after, uh, Foundation After Midnight Radio. It is glorious and hilarious to listen to. Radio Freezer. Radio Freezer. But we, what? Uh, I don't know. You're about to say something, and I stopped. No, no, I wasn't. We covered, you know, some not up of the half of them. We've covered some basic objects. I mean, we've covered one. We've covered the original, and we've covered fifty-five in the case of what we know what it isn't. But there are so many other interesting ways that people go about doing these articles. Are you um? What are you referencing? I'm referencing the creature that can only be described via pictures. Ah, ah! Here, let me um, let me go ahead and uh, let me go ahead and pull that one up. 
I will, uh, that one's gonna go in the, uh, that one's gonna go on the stream. Hang on. It's a fun one, and it, but it's kind of hard to describe talking about, it, which is kind of the point. It's also a little hard to find because it doesn't have a number. <laughs> right. Ah, it's okay. Here, here it is. And uh, we're not. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna talk about this. Partly because it's very, very difficult to talk about, and partly because it's terrifying to talk about when you think about the. Um... Okay, so here um... it is. Or here it will be for for Steve because he is a few seconds ahead of you guys, but um, here it is. So this is the object in question. So. It does have a number, just the numbers in Morse code, which makes it hard for me to know because I don't know Morse code. Oh, it's just it's just two five. Uh, it's just twenty five twenty one. I'm glad you know Morse Morse code. Anyway, so they have they have two dots placed... five dots two dots one dot. Sure. Oh, you're right. So they have replaced all of the information about this object with symbols, and if you kind of follow the narrative that the symbols are pointing out, then you understand why they have done that. You can't write about it, you can't save information about it, and you can't talk about it. Right. Because if you do, it will escape its containment and, well, take whatever was talking about it. I am concerned, like, concerned and afraid, because there is a heart right here. That's, um... I just love the picture of the little D-class hiding under the table. Yep. Yep. But yeah, this... Uh, so, the story behind this article is... They had a contest, the website did, that was write an SCP in 500 words or less. And this gentleman was either in a stroke of brilliance or absolute trolling, decided that he would make one with no words whatsoever. And won the contest. He did win the contest, yes. This has a happy ending. And a mention about the contest, what the Foundation does is every time they start a new series, so when they go from Series 1, which was SCP-001 to 999... Uh, when they start the new series over, they have a contest, and they set some rules out to just kind of get the new section started. Right. You'll you'll have uh, uh, various different things like uh, I can't remember all of them because I wasn't around for many of them. I I'm kind of a recent convert to SCP, but I've spent a lot of hours reading up on this. Yeah, you actually, it's kind of like TV tropes in that you can spend infinite hours just reading the reading the articles. Speaking of TV tropes... Oh my god, why have, I, why have I done this? Did you know that TV tropes is considered an SCP item? That doesn't surprise me any. It is SCP-4445, object class, Thalmiel. God damn it. Okay, well, I'm reading that. So anyway, uh... I just love at the end of it, it makes a reference, we see you seeing us seeing you too. 44 what now? 4445, I'll link it to you. The day the music died? Sure. Also, if you just type in SCP Wiki on TV Tropes, it'll take you to the page. It's, it, granted, it's SCP-445 is 
as the caveat J as joke page. Oh, but, it's a J. Uh, yeah. Okay. I was like, because there is an actual 4445, just saying. But uh, on the actual, you know, it's just that's where you find SCP 4445 J. Right. Beyond that, it's referenced, you know, straight up as an actual Class 7 memetic filtration program. Filtration? Well, yeah, somebody's got to filter your memes. And we, anybody who knows me and Brandon knows that 95% of the time we speak in meme. Um, I, in particular, am really, really bad about that. So SCP Foundation is just kind of a good fit for us because there's so much memetic references and literally everything in your soul. Memes. Literally everything is memes. Speaking of something that kind of fits within the uh, meme variation, and based upon a conversation I actually had at work last night, you remember 1471, Brent? No, I don't know numbers. The telephone program with uh, Skeledog. What? S telephone program with Skeledog. This might be one I haven't read. Well, I make a reference because um, somebody at work yesterday brought up uh, the whole Momo thing. Momo? Apparently, it, I don't know. It's apparently some sort of, um, well, I guess it would be considered a memetic agent that people download through WhatsApp or something along that lines, and it just sends messages to your phone and all kinds of... Basically, it plays the Psycho Mantis uh, BS from Metal Gear Solid, but just plays it with your phone, but is also an excuse for, um, you know, hackers to steal your info from your phone as well, so don't ever do that. Just, just, just leave it the hell alone. I... That seems reasonable. I guess... So, 1471 is considered a Euclid-class object, but it's extremely terrifying for you. Well, most Euclids can be extremely terrifying. Yeah, a lot of things can be extremely... Oh, I know this one. Yeah, Skeledog. Yeah, Skeledog. Mallow, right. Oh. So, for those not... In the no SCP-1471 is a free 9.8 meg application for mobile devices named Mallow version 1.0.0. Essentially, once you install the app, it doesn't have anything on your phone, but eventually you start getting strange text messages every three to six hours. And all images will contain SCP-1471-A, which is the aforementioned Skeledog. Skeledog, Skeledog. Skeledog. Gonna show a picture of Skeledog on my stream he here on Twitch. <laughs> Please don't ban me, Mr. Snitch. No, I didn't get there. <laughs> I, did, I tried. I tried, but it didn't go. SCP-147-1 appears to be a large humanoid figure with a canid-like skull and black hair. It does appear to do that. Here, I, I will, uh... Okay, what? Why do I open things with Microsoft Edge when I know that it's garbage? Because you drink as much as I do? I... have not been... Well, okay, I've, I'm having like I'm having like half a scotch, but I drank way too much yesterday, so I'm not. Uh, I am partaking, but not very much because my head is still a pain. <laughs> well, as we mentioned, there just kind of go on a brief description. So, yeah, once uh, once it catches up on the, just imagine you'll be receiving <laughs> pictures if you download this onto your phone. Just text it to you with this creature in the background. And then after 24 hours... Why we'll is it wearing you... a monk robe? Why isn't it wearing a monk robe? Don't look at me like that. 
Uh, essentially, after 24 hours, mobile device will receive images taken at locations frequented by the person whose phone is, the app is downloaded on. Uh, 48 hours, you'll receive pictures take with the that the Skeleton dog in it, taken re- that you've recently visited. And after 72 hours, a mobile device will receive images of the individual in real time, with 1471-A appearing within close proximity to the subject. But it should be noted. But I'm fairly sure it won't hurt you. Fairly I think sure. it slowly drives you insane. I don't think it has to, though. No, no, Individuals with over 90 hours of exposure to these continuous images will begin to briefly visualize SCP-1471-A within their peripheral vision, reflective surfaces, or a combination of the after continued exposure, after this point, will cause irreversible and sustained visualiz- visualizations of SCP-1471-A. To date, no apparent hostile activity has been reported by, regarding SCP-1471-A. Yeah. But you still have a skeleton dog haunting your every waking moment. Yeah, but you'll be fine. Hopefully. You'll be fine. Everything's fine. Everything is fine. And I'm pretty sure that even though it's not referenced in this, this would be another this would be an antithesis to fifty five. One four seven one is essentially a mimetic op. It's not. It actually does text you. Yes, but eventually, due to the uh, influence of the uh, program, you start to see it in real life. Yeah, that's true, but you say that like you say that like you've never seen things in real life. I see things in real life all the time. I'm seeing things right now. Do you see a skeleton dog out of your peripheral vision? No, well, yeah, actually, yes, because the picture was still there, but... <laughs> so, you know, this just goes to show the, you know, these are a th- couple of different... a couple of different objects, and they're all delightfully different. Now, that's not to say that of the 4,000 plus objects on the site, there aren't objects that have similar functions and repeats and usually what ends up happening with those is they get worked into a um a um overarching story and filtered in and just factoring into a group of interest or one or the other yeah true um are you talking about like the misters or whatever i was thinking anderson robotics oh sure yeah because why have a bunch of unrelated robots if you could just have a bunch of related robots? Exactly. And we'll just kind of briefly touch on it because I'm sure we'll dive more into it later. But the various, as we met, as I mentioned earlier, you have the SCP items and then you have the pros and the lore and the stories that tie a lot of them together. Like, you're very unlikely to come across an android or a robot and not have it factor into Anderson Robotics in some way. You're not about to come across some sort of uh, fucked up child children's toy or children's card game and it not be related to Dr. Wondertainment in some way, shape, or... A children's card game. Fun fact, Dr. Wondertainment made a children's card game for the SCP Foundation. And gave it to them. It has its. It has an object classification. It is a reality warping board game like Jumanji, and it is considered safe. Well, yeah, because if you just leave it in the box, it won't do anything. Correct. It's actually this is like it's marvelously simple. Right? 
But, you know, we've hit on some of these, but I think a lot of people, aside from being familiar with 173, they might be familiar with a couple of other um, objects. Like what? Well, you had Containment Breach that featured the... Uh, oh, true, that had Shy Guy and Dr. Plagues and... But uh, around that time, you also had... Radical Larry. You, you also had SCP-87. The walking simulator where you're on the stairwell. Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's amazing. Right? No, no, so, no, I'm sorry. Something else is amazing. Okay, so... Oh. I just called one of the SCPs in Containment Breach Radical Larry because I heard someone say that on a stream one time. And guess what I found on Google when I Googled Radical Larry? There he is. Oh, there's there's some there's some lore and shit behind him too that's really fucking terrifying. And his official name is his actual name is apparently Lawrence. Yeah, because he's Radical Larry. Should we describe it for the people who are not familiar? Yeah, that bastard. Yeah, no, I, I'm not even gonna describe this one. I'm just gonna post this picture. Yeah. Just, up. just just stare at it. Just just stare at it. Let it stare back into your soul. I mean, he, he looks happy. He's smiling. Yeah. He's also, he's also wearing a vest? What is that? Yes, but the real question is what is the vest made of? Human skin, but I've never I've never actually like stopped and stared at this picture. Like I'm doing right now that I shouldn't do? Yeah, just keep staring at it. Let the abyss stare back and enter your soul. Eh. Sure, it'll be fine. So, uh, I forget his object class. What is his object? What? Not his object class. I know he's a Keter. But what's his number? 106? Oh, 106. yeah, 106. Yeah, SCP-106. His whole shtick is, you could leave him in a box, but didn't he just decide he's tired of being in the box? And... He has to go eat some. He is entirely capable of just walking through walls. But if you occasionally give him things to eat, he can be considered docile for a brief periods of time. Right, so you just have to feed him infinite supplies of, um, well, prisoners. Yep. And that's but, how we do it. That's how, yes. Also... <laughs> So SCP Foundation might appear as though they have very little concern about human life, but they really do. I mean, they have a lot of concern about um, certain human lives. Most well, I mean, human li most human lives. They have a great deal of concern about most human lives. The way I saw it described, and pre pre predominantly in uh, referring to the Ethics Committee of the SCP Foundation, that's right. They have the an ethics, ethics Committee. Yes. Um, every horrific thing that they've ever done in the pursuit of containing these objects has been the least horrible option they had at their disposal. Right. Because you want to minimize suffering. As much as possible. Yeah. Yeah. In that sense, it kind of has a lot in common with 40k. And there it is. We've made it uh, 42 minutes into the podcast, and 40K has been refereed. I mean, yeah, it was literally inevitable. Also, I hope everyone has enjoyed staring at my terrible desktop. Because I forgot to go back to the Save vs. Bourbon Splash. Yeah. <laughs> it is quite bad. Oh, God, it's awful. I don't, I don't even... I'm just still using the default Windows background. I at least have a Mad Cat as my background. It's going to be Radical Larry here in a minute. Damn right. Like, take, for instance, SCP-231. 231. 231 is... I don't know what it is. 110 Montauk. Oh, I don't want to... 
it, it's a bit of a long article to read, so I'll only hit the bullet points. But essentially, it is a um, it is a juvenile female that is locked away, and they have a monthly rotation of guards and personnel on this site. When they're on site, and anybody outside of their rooms, they're required to wear concealing helmets and integrated voice changers to protect their identity. Not from SCP-231-7, but from each other, just because of how horrific this site is implied to be. Right, because they have to do something called Procedure 110 Montauk, which they don't tell you what it is, but, um, yeah, they definitely tell you what it is, and, uh, I don't want to, I don't want to think about that, so... I mean, it depends on which uh, canon you want to go with. There are some... There's some horrific connotations for 110 Montauk, and then there aren't, but there yeah, are. I'm going but... to go with the I'm going to go with the canon where where 110 Montauk is literally nothing, and the actual containment procedure is everyone being terrified of 110 Montauk. Correct. And yes, and that's a real thing. That's somewhere on the site. I promise. It's actually, it's someone's I canon. Bl- I believe it's actually the one that Clef didn't write, but he approved. But then you have to dive back into what if 110 Montauk isn't absolutely nothing? What is it everything that your deepest, darkest fears and hatreds make your mind believe it is? And that is why we redact things. We redact things because your imagination is way worse than just saying what it is. Uh Uh-huh. So much worse. You know, I think we've danced around one for quite a bit now, though. Hmm. We were, uh, anybody who's familiar with our Genius Campaign might refer to this next one as, um, Barry. Ah, I forgot about Barry. So, Barry, that would be Object 682, which is actually the second object they ever made. An oldie but a goodie. It's, this one has, okay, 682 has the the distinction of having gotten better with age instead of worse. Because the longer it's on its site, the more interactions it can have with other objects. No, no, that's not at all what I'm getting at. Oh? No, I'm getting at this right here. SCP-682, Object Class, Keter. Special Containment Procedures. SCP-682 must be destroyed as soon as possible. You see... This is the only object on the site that, well, that canonically they're trying to destroy. Because destroying the things isn't what they do. It's special or the only thing that we've ever, or the one only thing we've actually actively come across in our searching. There right. might be another one out there, but but there are there are four thousand articles, and I'm not reading them all. I've actually read, like, quite a few of them, but I'm not reading them all. But that that is the important thing about 682. 682 is the Foundation itself acting out of character because they don't destroy things. It is not special destruction procedures. It is special containment procedures. Secure, right. contain, protect. Right. Yes, not just protecting the, thing, the world right? at large, but protecting the objects themselves. Because we're, you know, we want to be ethical with this shit. But no, this thing, no, destroy it. It's a giant lizard thing that can eat anything, including the acid that they have to that they have to keep it submerged in. Because if they don't, it will grow out of control and then kill them all. Good old, good old omnicidal lizard. Yep. 
and being that 682 is the second one ever created, you get uh, you know, still a little bit of early installment weirdness, but there have been edits made over time where you eventually see it interacting with other objects. And, you know, this is a good example to cite where not only the SCP uh, study the objects and contain them, but they also see how they interact with one another. Well, very rarely do they do that for obvious reasons. About as often as they have a kill command out for any specific object. No. I mean, kind of, but no. In 682's two, case, they just want it gone, so you start experimenting with things. Right, but they can't actually just put it... They, they can't actually just fire it into the sun because, well, they're not sure that would work. See Foundation After Midnight Radio for why that's a thing. I will do that. They... Just a hint. They do it in that canoe can cannon. It goes as well as you would expect. But then you go down to the bottom of six eight two and you find that they've logged all of their attempts at destroying this. Right, and they, there's a lot of interesting stories with that. Like, um, there is another object. There is another object that is a uh, a little boy or a little girl. I can't remember which, but it's a it's a little girl. I believe it's um, it's cyborg child. What number is? It? It's not cyborg child. Not cyborg child. No. 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 I know the one you're talking about. The one that makes everyone who sees her have homicidal urges. No. No, I'm talking about the one who, um, the one who, like, is a reality bender and can make stuff real if she reads about it. Oh. And Dr. Clef handed her a book, and the book was titled, The Monster That, that Can and Will Very Definitely Kill 682. It was not a, it was not a, it was not a... I believe that object was a pair of bookends. Oh, that might be it, yeah. It was a pair of bookends. Oh, yes, the bookends. That's right, that's right. You set any. You set what you write in between the two of them, and I believe it started out as a 12-page book titled The Large, The Giant Friendly Monster That Can Definitely Kill 682. Right. And it ended so, as a 600-page book titled The Big Friendly Monster Who Tried and Failed to Kill... To kill. SCP-682. I found it here. SCP-826, equipped with one copy of the generally nice, friendly thing that can and will kill SCP-682 permanently if it so much as spots the damn lizard. A 12-page short story written by Dr. Redacted, detailing a large, friendly monster that is stated to be capable of permanently killing SCP-682 and one D-Class personnel, D-682-32, equipped with one 2010 Ducati Multistrada motorcycle for the purpose of evading SCP-682. Tissue test record, not applicable. Termination test record. Story is put between SCP-826 and placed into a large, empty room. Redacted, redacted, redacted in dimension with a remotely operated doorway large enough to send SCP-682 through. SCP-682 is brought in front of the entry securely once researchers clear the area the door is remotely open exposing a green pasture similar to the one described in the story SCP-682 is reluctant to go through so D-682-32 is sent through to as bait 682 follows through doorway whereupon the door closes behind them 30 minutes later SCP-682 bursts back through the doors it went. It was sent through somewhat worse for wear killing redacted number of researchers and redacted number of agents in the process. <clears throat> Recovery per personnel features having become a battleground, featuring impact craters with enormous body parts scattered around. Parts are thought to be from the story's thing. Recovered story is retitled, The Generally Nice, Friendly Thing That Tried to Kill SCP-682 Permanently But Failed. It is noticeably thicker, with 209 individual pages that detail an epic battle between the two monsters. Right. 
So the um, the end result of that is uh, no, you can't you can't kill it. Oh, you can order a cup of a cup of the a cup of what will kill six eight two from the vending machine. It explodes instantly and you die, but you can do it. Just make sure you don't ask for a cup of Joe. Yeah, don't ask for a cup of Joe. You will get a cup of Joe, and Joe will not like it. Uh, then you have the time where you tried to send 682 to another... Uh, another re and it didn't work. Because, as response, Dear Universe 5802-Sigma Blue Romeo, it's your problem now, suck. <laughs> mm. I mean, there's another up there. I, I was making reference to the time where they had, they have, um, and this is getting to some of the more sad parts of the SCP Foundation. Mm. The objects aren't always omnicidal god lizards and statues and mimetic agents. It also can just be people. That's true. There are several just people that are anomalous. There's one, I forget her number. I think it's a low number, but she is a, I believe described as a juvenile female child. I think that her age is actually listed as like three or four. And just normal, happy child, uh, normal intelligence for that level of development, so on and so forth. But any person or thing that spends around 10 minutes with her suddenly feels the intense and sudden urge to kill her, usually in a horrific manner. But as soon as said person enacts those thoughts uh, the child is harmed but that person dies and the child heals right so they thought it'd be a good idea to let's see what happens if we throw this child in with 682 and it's probably one of the most adorable things on the site uh yeah yeah definitely Ooh, ooh. Uh, and then you that. have then you have the situation where the same doctor who started that test uh, decided to throw an ordinary human child in there and then he eventually ended up in the fucking cage with 6A2 because he's a yeah because it turns out if you're a giant asshole somebody's going to throw you in the cage with the giant monster <laughs> karma you were saying uh, I was saying um I did want to talk about the, about one, okay? I want to talk about one for all you DMs out there, okay? Mm -hmm. And the one I want to talk about for all you DMs out there is number 939. It's this one. That is 6A2. Good job, me. Good job, good job. You're on top of things tonight. My, I am just, I am just fucking special tonight. Anyway... 939. So what 939 is, okay, is it's a dog. Kind of. It's a big dog. Uh, like a human-sized dog. It's also not a dog, but it's got giant teeth and it likes to eat people. Amnestic dog! That's the one! And there's, you know, an unknown number of them. They're uh, the wild animal that lives on the fringes of society eating people. Just mostly people. And, um, they excrete when they breathe a cloud of gas that makes you forget the last half hour. Used to or, no, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, that's wrong. It doesn't make you forget the last half hour. It makes you not remember what happens for a half hour. There we go. Used to great effect by our glorious storyteller, Brandon. Yeah, that's exactly right. So, uh, the other thing that they do, these, these giant dog monsters, is they... Uh, speak with human voices. It's not totally clear whether they actually understand what they're saying, or they just use the panicked screams of their for, of their victims as um, as bait for more victims. But 
they are capable of, of uh, exactly mimicking the voice of anyone they eat. Because one of those options is less terrifying than the other. Right. So, this is why I say that they're good for DMs, right? Because it's a giant monster, so it is a physical threat that you can fight with guns. They are perfectly killable. They're not like immortal or invincible or anything. And they're an actual species out there, so you can, you know, you can have there be several of them, and your party can not have to feel bad about blowing them up if they need to. They make a satisfying popping noise when you shoot them. Yes, indeed. But, here's the other thing about them, right? One, they're insidious, because they, they talk, they talk, they talk, they talk, and it's terrifying. Your party goes after what they think is a distress call, and turns out to be a giant monster who wants to eat their faces with their giant needle teeth. They also make a satisfying popping sound when you shoot them. True. But lastly, you can also use them to play fun games with your players, such as, Hey guys, how did you get here? Or, or, uh, dear party members, do you remember the last half hour? The results may shock you. You may be surprised by the results, yes. So, I have used these creatures in a campaign. I gave them stats, pretty basic predator stats, something like a big tiger. And set them loose in, in, the, in the facility where the party was. And had a lot of fun just making things happen. Things where the party would have encountered one. Okay, so the party entered a room where they would have encountered one and almost certainly, like, there was a 0% chance that they were not going to kill it because of the way the party is. So I literally just skipped the room in the storytelling. I skipped the room, rolled some quick combat off off screen, and told them that I t- and told them that one of them had a bad bite wound and they were all covered in something that wasn't blood. I did not tell them why. Why that was. They had no idea why that was. That was an interesting thing that occurred. It was. It was only later that they, that they or when they encountered more of them that they that they realized what must have happened. Oh, also your gun, your gun, Steve, had less bullets in it than it should have. Oh yeah, that. Uh, granted, I'm I'm using something that um, at this point is less becoming a actual handgun and or bolt pistol and is slowly becoming a relativistic kill weapon. I mean. It's still a gun. It just makes things not exist anymore. It, yeah, that's what guns do. Messily. Yeah. I thought another reason that we had some benefit there is because we didn't bring uh, Robin into the site, so we had Scuttle around with us and he didn't breathe in the fumes. Ah, that's right. That's how you figured out what happened because you went back through you went back through the robot's logs. I'm sorry. This this session had happened like a year ago. We become I, well. I say we. My characters become much better at killing things. True. True. At any rate, um. So there's a lot of or so. That was an interesting trick to pull narratively, and uh, these creatures could fit into any, um, any thing, 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 words. They could fit into any scenario, really, so anyone who wants to play a horrifying trick on their players can absolutely use these guys. As a player who's had this happen to them, I recommend you do this for your players, because it's fun and it's hilarious. And it's always delightful to just kind of uh, 
just kind of play with your player's sense of time. Right, and that decision was a great one because all all four of us are, you know, dangerously genre savvy when it comes to a lot of things at this, you know, we were then we're even more but then you throw these at us and then suddenly we don't know what's going on or what happened. And if you can ever remove that element right of, yeah it, it it uh the amnestic effect immediately and instantly puts your players in a position where they do not know what the hell just happened. They don't know exactly where they are. They know that there is something dangerous around, but have no idea what it is. It's scary. And the only way it's worse is if you, uh, as it's been mentioned a couple times at this point, throw something like a doctor in a plague mask at somebody who's read a lot of SCP art. Well, true. So that is like kind of a weakness with doing this. Like if you're... Uh, if your players are familiar with this stuff, then they're going to know when you do this. But... You can turn that knowledge against them. If your players are familiar with this stuff, then... Uh, yeah, exactly. Exactly. These objects are anomalous. They do not have to behave the way it says they behave. Terror is a thing. Yes, it is. You know what, Brandon? We've talked about a lot of horrific, horrific things from SCP. Uh-huh. How about we talk about? How about we talk about something you know not as horrific? Um. Yeah, we can talk about something not as horrific. What have you got? What about nine ninety nine? Oh, the tickle monster. The tickle monster. Yeah, we can talk about the tickle monster. By the way. The fact that 999 is not a dash J, it it offends me. How? Hello? Hello? I thought I lost connection there for a second. Okay. You might have. So, SCP-999, just going from memory, is described as... Well, who's played Dragon? Dragon? What are you talking about? Who's ever seen a slime before? Oh, slimes. Yeah, I know slimes. I like slimes. So SCP-999 is just described as a orange blob of blob. Right, it's just an orange blob of ooze that, uh... Well, it likes pets. And it causes, you know... Mild, mild euphoria upon being touched. It is designated as a safe object because, granted, if you put it in a box, it remains in the box. But it's so cute and adorable, it's just kind of something of a morality pet? Yeah, I guess you could call it that. Plus, you know, it's Plus, you're dealing with these horrific, horrific world-ending objects on a daily basis. Having something that goes around just makes you feel better, and like scratch scratches behind the gelatinous ears is. It 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 doesn't it doesn't have ears. Doesn't mean it can't make you gelatinous ears. Y- yes, it does. Then how did it drag those guys away from 682's rampage? With its pseudopods, which are not ears. You could make it pseudopods resemble ears. You don't know it. You don't know it's like. You're you're right. I do not know it. I do not know the tickle monster's life. You're right. I'm sorry. <laughs> Uh, 
So, I mean, it's a fairly long article, but it could just be so. It's just a ball of ooze that likes being affectionate and loving people. Isn't there an anime about that? There is. There is an anime about that that I have yet to finish watching. But, as with everything in the Foundation, not everything can be just, you know, hunky-dory, a okay because somebody thought to give uh, Expose 999 to 682. Oh, it was fine. Nothing bad happened. Except for 682 adopted its, you know, ability to release uh, waves of euphoria and just made everybody feel all happy and while it broke containment and murdered a bunch of people. But 999... I mean, okay, look. Here's the thing, okay? Follow me here. 682 breaches containment and kills a bunch of people all the time. That is just what it does. So, really, you can't blame 999. Oh, no, I'm not blaming 999. I'm blaming the researcher who thought it was a good idea to, you know, combine the... No. No, it's fine. Look, okay, if, if, if 999 didn't cause that containment breach... Something else would have, because you can't contain 682. It's fine. Everything's fine. But also on the topic of things that make the Foundation feel better, there is, well, there's one that makes the Foundation terrified, and there's one that's just just a feel-good story. A feel-good story, huh? Organ transplant bear. Organ transplant bear. You don't mean builder bear, do you? No, there's another bear. Builder bear just looks like a teddy bear. Organ transplant bear looks like um, like a teddy bear if your grandma tried to make it out of the old quilt. It's all patchwork and everything, but what it does is it's capable of it's capable of performing organ transplants on people who need them, replacing kidneys and inoperable tumors and things like that. And it just goes out of its way and it replaces the offending. Like, if it removes a kidney, replaces it with a um, patchwork and, you know, stuffing-filled organ that works just the same, and the person, you know, is allowed to live. Except for the one time they introduced it to somebody with a terminal disease, and the bear didn't know what to do, so it just, you know, looked around panic for a few seconds, and then just hugged the person that introduced it. Aww. That's, I'm sorry, that's actually kind of adorable. Right? Uh, that reminds me of the rocket surgeon. Oh? Yeah, uh, let me, let me try to find it. Yeah, SCP-890, the rocket surgeon. Link. I'm actually having trouble finding things to link to you because every time I try to type in an SCP number on the site, it I time out. So I'm just having to go through the actual series listings. Ouch. Um, so the rocket surgeon is a man who is a doctor and performs surgery on machines. I don't mean he fixes machines. I mean, he performs surgery on machines. I remember this guy. He's great. Yeah. He just literally, literally does surgery on machines. It also says that it can't do surgery on living things because, well, he's a surgeon, not a veterinarian. I just love the picture on this one because it's just, you know, he's just staring at you. Yeah. It's great. But there, there are so many, you know, hope spots in SCP. Like you have uh, Cassie, for example. You're familiar with Cassie, right, Brent? 
Uh, do you mean the do you mean the 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 living drawing? The living drawing, yeah. I, okay, I've got to be real for just a second here, okay? Humanoid SCP or intelligent SCPs are like ninety percent garbage. It's all a matter of perspective. I enjoy them. They're fun to read. Fair enough. But it does allow us to sight in on uh, the... Uh, God, what is it? The... Uh, what is the designation for it? The clockwork machine. The uh, thing you feed objects to and it... Uh, ref the thing you feed objects to? It's like the clockwork, it's not the clockwork god or anything, but like it's 916, it has the multiple settings, fine, coarse, so on and so forth. It's what they allowed the SCP to make cast. Okay, yeah. Nine four. Nine four what? Nine one four. Nine one four. I will link such. It's described as a safe object because it's not sentient in any way that you can lock it in a room and nothing occurs. Oh, this is not this is not the one that's that's made of uh, naturally occurring ropes, pulleys, and levers, or gears. I mean, I'm I mean it is, but it isn't. No, no, no. <laughs> Someone specifically used the words naturally occurring ropes, gears, and pulleys. Naturally occurring. <laughs> I don't think that means what I think it means. But 914 is an interesting case because it's just a case, another one of those ones where it was written and then people just kind of ran with it and started doing experiments. Like you have the test log where they input one kilogram of steel on the setting rough and you get a pile of steel chunks of varying size. But somebody fed through... Um, Forgive us a piece of paper. What they they fed through it, something a piece of paper, and then they what came out the other end was and a living drop. Oh right. Yeah, yeah, I remember this. So there you have how all these different objects are linked together in some way, shape, or form, and that's before you even dive into the stories that link everything to. This essentially boils down to a lot of the time it's just kind of fan fiction for SCP. Well, I mean, a lot of things are just kind of fan fiction for SCP. True enough. SCP is mostly fan fiction for itself. Exactly. What should we hit on? I don't know. Did we cover Shy Guy? We did not cover Shy Guy. We did mention Shy Guy. So, Shy Guy is like the opposite of one, of uh, 173. Because, well, here, this one's Shy Guy, uh, 96. But it's like the opposite of 173, because... Its whole shtick is you don't want to keep eye contact with. Right, because if you look at if you see its face, it will murder you, or I'm sorry, it will blank you, but you will die. It will redact you to death. Yay, death redaction! <laughs> oh. 
but it is words words are hard and 96 is interesting because i think it was also an early one wasn't it yeah 96 was was very early i think it might have been it wasn't literally third because by that point a lot of them were coming out of the woodwork and only like some of them even stuck but this is one of the ones that did but 96 is like um to uh, 25 21 and that you can't have well it's not like but it's kind of the opposite of it whereas 2521 you can only describe with pictures you can't have any even have any pictures of 90 right because if you see its face it will blank you exactly uh, if you look at its face i mean you could look at it you can look at it as normal as long as you don't look at its face but then you have these strange circumstances where there's one point there's a of somebody hiking in the mountain somewhere and it's just you know this guy sitting on a mountainside and then in the distance when you see the picture it's just there's a big black spot over it because what happened was the person who took this picture accidentally caught a glimpse of 96's face they didn't realize they'd caught it so nothing occurred at the time until somebody was looking at the picture and happened to notice the blur in the background and then 96 broke containment and redacted. Uh, and also redacted a whole lot of people in between the two places. All the redact. It was very redacted. It was redacted for a long time. It was. And when they, and when they sent the uh, security division out to... Uh, well, acquire it the first time or reacquire it. At one point, they had sent, it out, sent some people out to reacquire it. They fired a shit ton of weapons at this bastard and accomplished absolutely nothing. They hit it with a 50 caliber. They hit it with 50 caliber. They hit it with a GAL-19. They hit it with shoulder-mounted rockets. They hit it with everything you would expect a crack military squad to have, and it didn't fucking flip. Well, I mean, it didn't flinch, but it's not like it didn't get hurt. Yeah, it got hurt, but it healed. Yeah. Which rings kind of back around to 682. Every They go out of their way to try to kill 682, but can 682 or 96 or other objects like it, can they be described as living beings, living creatures that can't be? I mean, yes, Jim Mark. Actually, yeah, that um, that puts me in mind of uh, what happened to Site Thirteen. Oh, that's some good. That's some good lore there. So, what happened to Site Thirteen is a story about a alternate universe foundation site that got um, transported across reality into our world and the only real Quote unquote. well there were several differences between the two um, between the two realities but one of the main ones was that the foundation um, wasn't into the whole securing containing and protecting thing it was into the whole destroying things thing But, as someone pointed out in the story, what happened to Site-13, also known as uh, SCP-20... I can't remember. It's 2000-something. But, as somebody pointed out, um, being alive isn't what makes these things anomalous. In fact, being alive is the least anonymous, alum, anomalous thing about most of the anomalous objects that are alive. And the object class you're looking for is SCP-1730. 1730, thank you. But the point is, um, if you were to quote-unquote kill 96, would it stop redacting things that saw its face? What if you took its face off? Would it stop redacting things? If you launched it into the very depths of deep space would it find a way back to redact thing right if you if you took a, if you took a sledgehammer to to 173 
until it was a pile of rubble, would that pile of rubble move if you weren't looking at it? Which brings about... You mentioned that. It brings about the uh, teleporting chair. The remains of a chair? The remains of a chair. I'm actually going to literally post this one because it's, it's terribly sad. It is, and I'll... I'll just talk about it off the top of my head while you do so we mentioned groups of interest before there's different ones one of them's the global occult occult coalition their shtick is more along the lines of destroy everything anomalous well they took it upon themselves they came across an anomalous object that was literally just a chair it, granted, it was a slightly creepy chair with you know some humanoid aspects to it like a head and arms or, you know, the arms and legs of the chair, and so on and so forth. But they decided to run the bastard through a wood chip. So, what he left out is that the anomalous, um, the anomalous thing that the chair would do is if someone around needed a chair to sit in, it would teleport so that they could sit in it. That's all it did. Absolutely harmless. Absolutely harmless. But they ran it through a wood chipper, and now it's a pile of splinters and wood chippings and furniture nails that, um, well, can still teleport. And now it likes to teleport into people's lungs. So at any point, if it hears anything that closely resembles the sound of a wood chipper starting up, it will teleport around and just start uh, filling people's lungs with the aforementioned... Aforementioned nails and wood chips. So... Then you see the vast difference between these two organizations, the Global Occult Coalition and then SCP. SCP's solution, when they finally manage to get this object in containment, is they essentially provide it with uh, some dirt and other things, and they essentially use it as a living compost. Or, uh, and then, you know, the it, they grow plants and flowers in it and everything, and just leave it be, and, you know, it's content to content to what Steven it's it's content to just kind of exist and be uh, be the basis of a very nice garden yeah yeah because they're using it for mulch yeah and you know but that's in fact mentioned in the article you whenever you're witness the garden or near the garden you complimented on how nice it is and the article is the item is appeased and doesn't teleport around filling people's lungs with uh, mulch and wood chips and well ideally ideally it doesn't do that ideally but then you have and that's you know there's a lot of items that go about and have a tendency of filling people's bodies with the phrase comes to mind, ear growths. That's so weird. Like, I, I, I know I haven't, like, mentioned at all how weird that is, but it's super weird. And terrifying. But yeah, terrifying, but super weird. Okay, I realize that it was a bear made of ears, but there's no reason that, the, that a bear made of ears should be able to make ears grow on everything. It doesn't make any sense. Maybe we should just turn, maybe we should link what we're talking about. No, no, this one's way better without context. <laughs> um, we mentioned earlier Builder Bear. It's um, linked to that. Yes, I'm going to link to Builder Bear. Or I was going to link to Builder Bear. What the hell? So Builder Bear is an object kind of along the same lines as uh, Organ Transplant Bear. In that it was an, and it's also an example of what happens when you just kind of leave these objects without observation. Right, because it's an animate teddy bear that likes hugs. It, it couldn't possibly be dangerous, right? Right. Except for when it starts making copies of itself out of things like, um, I believe ears. one was like, out of ears and organs and rusty blades. 
and, and then, uh, then the copies I, I, are uh, very, 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 very mean. The an unformed fetus may have been involved in the creation of one of the pop. Yeah. So, by and large, Builder Bear was allowed to roam free throughout the facility, much like uh, 990. Until it started making copies, and the copies started butchering people. I believe they upgraded it to Keter? Yeah, yeah, they did. Because it, it doesn't actually... It doesn't actually matter how safe something appears to be. If you don't understand what it is or how it does what it does... You, um... You're begging for unpleasantness. Begging for unpleasantness, right. And the worst part about this is... I don't... You can't even really say that 10, uh, 1048 Builder Bear fits within the box test because they don't know where the fucker is any. Yeah. Yeah. They didn't leave it in a box, so now it could be anywhere. Who Granted, knows? it's in the larger box that is the site. It's site twenty four, but they think it is. So just remember that the next time your niece, your nephew, or your child just shows you a teddy bear that they were given as a gift, or they found somewhere, or they say that Teddy can dance and he has friends. Yeah, Teddy has friends. <laughs> you know, uh, I think I should mention some correlations between this as well. Um, going back to 173, anybody who's a fan of Doctor Who will notice how 173 appears to essentially be a weeping angel. Yeah, and the weird thing is... The two things happened completely separately. The Weeping Angels episode had been written but had not aired when 173 was produced. Which kind of goes back into the weird just social What's the word I'm looking for? Is it zeitgeist? I guess it's a zeitgeist. I guess you're a zeitgeist. Eh, we're all a zeitgeist. Your face is a zeitgeist. My face is beautiful, sir. Uh... I may be a little drunk. Good. But uh, you also you have correlations between uh, a couple different things. It's this weird, <laughs> weird thing kind of diving back into 40K a bit how you have the Tyranids in 40k and how they were essentially based on the Xenomorphs and then you have the Zerg and Stark. Sure. Except well, that that's not what happened. Like, the 173 and the Weeping Angels were made completely independently of each other. Right, right. But just the way that you... I was kind of trying to link that to uh, how you have... Because this is a correlation I saw. You have... Raiders of the Lost and where they store the Ark of the Covenant and how it's guarded by top men. Top men. Top men. Top men. Which you could almost, you know, with some editing, you could almost say, oh, that's just an early SCP site. Right. But then, you know, here recently, within the last, you know, a couple years ago, you had the series Warehouse 13. Which is also a very similar premise. Do I think that the writers of Warehouse 13 knew anything about SCP? Maybe one did, but you don't get that franchise based solely on SCP. Well, but it, also you also wouldn't get... matter, it wouldn't matter if they did, because Creative Commons! Correct. But then you have, you know... I can't imagine that many of the people writing the early SCP articles weren't familiar with Raiders of the Lost Ark, so you can kind of have this weird correlations there where they seem related, but they're, they aren't really, but they are. It's just, you know, fun to dive through and see those various... And you can almost kind of tell that as the web, as the site went on and as technology got better and better, you saw more things come to 
forefront. And you saw items start appearing, certain types of items appearing in waves. Yeah, that's true. That did happen. Like all, like a lot of the humanoids happened at the same time, and a lot of the humanoids got uh, decommissioned. Decommissioned. At the same time. Because most of them were just shitty self-insert characters. Right, and they were decommissioned by the characters who weren't shitty self-insert characters who were just mentioned as, you know, name holders. But then the name holder characters became shitty self-insert characters. Ah, oh, the cycles of the site. Really, it's the cycles of the internet. The internet is for porn and SCP. And YouTube. Yes, but SCP is on YouTube. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. You know, we mentioned it a lot of times. I don't think we actually cited an example of a memetic agent. Well, yeah, we did. Mallow. Right. Well, there, yeah, I remember you had some conflict with that, but like a true, what you would think is defined as a memetic agent. Oh, like, uh, well, like the memetic kill agents they use for security or whatever? Speaking of memetic kill agents, I saw where you got your memetic kill agent for the session the other week, you bastard. It came exactly from where it was supposed to. I didn't make the connection until I saw it reading that particular page recently. Uh huh. Anyway, um, so yeah, that's a common conceit in SCP articles that there's there are in, what are called info hazards or or cogito hazards that are things that um, are harmful or fatal to know about or to see or to hear. Not because, like, some object is going to come and attack you like 96. Like, you having seen 96's face is not the hazard. The hazard is that it's coming to kill you. I'm talking about things that um, cause harm just by you knowing about them. And I'm Let's actually find a good example of a cogito hazard here. I'm just looking at MTF at, uh, at a ten, see no evil, because they're the ones responsible for containing. That's true. Uh, let's see, you got 020, 125, 571, 90. And cognito hazards are just the best. They are, in fact, pretty excellent. Uh, 125 is a sentient being that can only exist within reflection. I mean, this might sound unprofessional as hell, but, um, I mean, there's so much stuff on this site. We couldn't really go through and just document everything we wanted to talk about or, you know, we'd be here forever. So we're just kind of take, finding interesting things. Well, really, we could do that all night. True. Oh, Zero Twenty is a fast-spreading fungal organism that can only be seen via photographic or video surveillance. That's terrifying. What's terrifying? Zero twenty. It's essentially a fungal spread that infects everything, but to the naked eye, you don't know it's there unless you're looking at it through photographic or video. Video. Oh yeah. Oh, SCP one five six one. The uh, the crown that can only be referred to as His Majesty's crown. I think I'm going to go with I am a toaster. 
Ah! Yes. Let me just uh, let me just find that real quick. SCP-426 is a toaster. It is literally a toaster. It toasts bread. That is all it does. It toasts bread. And also, you can't talk about it except in the first person. Yes, the first person. I am a toaster. I am also a toaster. And so... You can only refer to the toaster as I. No matter what. Period. You can only refer to me as I. Yes, you can only refer to me in the first person. The... And that's all. That's all it does. Doesn't sound that scary. But... If you're around the toaster for long enough, you will eventually start thinking that you are a toaster. You will eventually electrocute yourself trying to toast bread. Or die from shoving bread down your gob in an attempt to toast it. Or die from... I don't know. Attempting to reach temperatures capable of creating toast. Or, or starve to death waiting for the toast to come out. Oh my god. But yeah, yeah, that's a... Uh... That's a good example of a Kagado hazard. It's just... It's a very insidious one, because all it seems to do is make you... Uh, refer to me in the first person, but... If you do that for long enough... You become me. Yeah. Oh, it's also important to note that in in that SCP, you uh, you are not aware that you are referring to it in the first person. I'm probably some huge monster hold up in there. That's what you guys have all over this place, right? Yep. Where are you? Four twenty six is a good one. What's it? Five seventy one, that's just a single piece of paper. That's all it is. What what does it do? SCP-571 is a complex pattern of lines and scribbles with an anomalous mimetic effect. Appearance was determined by cutting an image of 571 into sections and rearranging the sections, disabling the pattern's anomalous effect and allowing it to be safely... Sure. The current anomalous effects follow. When any human looks at SCP-571 for any amount of time, they will immediately search for a piece of paper or other suitable stationery. The exposed human will then begin to copy SCP-571 into the, onto the new paper with any available drawing implement. Despite the particularly high complexity of the pattern, copying a 571 by exposed human will be successful approximately 96% of the time. Once it has been copied, they will attempt to seek out other humans and attempt to coax or force them to view the copied pattern. Successfully infected victims will immediately attempt to copy the pattern. Okay. So it's just a pattern that 
makes you pattern the pattern. Hey, look at this awesome meme I found. Oh, that's awesome. Hey, guy, look at this awesome meme I found. Hey, guy, hey, look at this awesome meme I found. Yeah, I was going to say, that's, that seems very familiar. I'm waiting for the part where it get, jumps from safe to Euclid to Keter. It just skips key, it just skips Euclid entirely. Jumps oh no, it actually goes from it actually goes from anomalous. They think it's not even, you know, an object, it's just a random anomalous object. To Wait. Euclid and then to Keter. Ah. Awesome. All right, this is one of those so there's another uh, item classification in SCP that's not really used often because no one cares. They're simply the anomalous objects. Objects that there's something off about them, but they don't have to be contained. You could just you leave them on your desk, like um, like a paperweight that. Um, oh, are you talking about has... to the cleverest? Huh? Are you talking about to the cleverest? Uh, maybe, but eventually, you know, you just have these objects that. They're not dangerous in any way, shape, or form, and they have no real, you know, dangerous effects. So they're just kind of left about, as it were. But this one was considered. Oh, okay. So yeah, here we go from the uh, Keter to the from the anomalous to Euclid to Keter. If uh, just left to their own devices, people who are exposed to this pattern will continue drawing it, foregoing anything else. You know, until the. Till they die. And that's where it gets into where I think mimetic hazards and cognito hazards are some of the more dangerous things on the site because they can be as a not. Just, you know, just as simple as a picture on a phone. Yeah, that's true. Cognito hazards are fucking awesome, especially in RP. That's why I made mimetic filter. Yeah, I know. They don't always work, though. Oh, God, sorry, I had to stretch. Yar. Should we maybe talk about some of the groups of interest since we've just kind yeah, of skimmed over? Yeah, let's talk about like GOIs and the and things. I guess um, my personal favorite is uh, Are We Cool Yet? They are hilarious. So, Are We Cool Yet? It it is not currently possible to search the SCP wiki. Damn you! I know so, it's working. Are we cool yet? Is a bunch of artists that it's referred to as an artists, an artist, right? That um, well, they can make anomalous art pieces, art installations, they call them. And whether they're whether they actually create the anomalies or find anomalies and then make art pieces out of them, we don't really know. The important thing is that they make art pieces that have a meaning. For example, not a shark. Yay, not a shark. Not a shark is, well, it's not a shark. It is a space in a, in a pool that isn't a shark. It's in the general shape of a shark, but there is no shark there. Which does not stop it from biting people. But the that was um, not a shark. The an artist in question was actually doing an art piece about like the nature of fear. Yeah, here we go. So, 
when the thing that isn't a shark was released into the swimming pool, it killed two swimmers, but five people were killed in the ensuing panic. Panic's more dangerous than a shark. The I, uh, here, yeah, here it is. The, uh, uh, this is a message from the artist. Panic means that the idea of a shark can be more dangerous than an actual shark. It can even be more dangerous than no shark. Are we cool yet? Right. And essentially, I mean, it's got that same feel to it. Well, it's hard to explain. Are we cool yet? Items. It's yeah, almost because like... they're all very they're all very different from each other. But the point is that they're they're different from most anomalies in that they have a very exact purpose. Their purpose is, you know, depending upon H. Arthur, uh, Arthur, artist. Yeah, it's just. It's, it's not about... Okay, look. Look. It's not about the containment procedures. It's about sending a message. Uh, and most of the time, this message isn't you put one of ours in the hospital, we put one of yours in the morgue. No, the message is usually some kind of deeper message about the nature of stuff. Because, you know... Ooh. Because Ari Juliet's a bunch of ponces. Essentially, I, well, I think one of my favorite references to Are We Cool Yet, there is a, there's a site, I forget the number off the top of my head, but it's essentially uh, just a stretch of wilderness in the Pacific Northwest that, once upon a time, an uh, agent of the SCP Foundation went out of her way to you know try to get it uh, stationed as wildlife sanctuary, just kind of protect it from development and everything. And she happened to be a – her focus happened to be on preventing um, acoustic-based cognitohazards and anomalies. Like, her job was to essentially silence them and create things in ways to make them less anomalous by silencing them and pr things like that. Well, there was one – a uh, member of Are We Cool Yet, whose entire goal was to make things that were loud and made noise and so on and so forth. And they, he he doesn't know how she particularly felt about it, but he felt it as more, more of a rivalry. And so just a series of one-upmanship and so on and so forth. Uh, eventually she uh, she dies due to an illness and is, like most Foundation personnel, is just kind of left in an unmarked grave in an urn. And he goes out of his way to dig her up and bury her in this stretch of wilderness, a uh, stretch of land that she fought very hard for in her life and creates an, an anomalous installation that essentially allows the entire area to not go rise above like 10 decibels. It is an area that is swarming with monarch butterflies and should anything make a noise louder than 10 decibels, the monarch butterflies flood them, surround them, and neutralize the sound. They don't kill it, they just muffle the sound completely. Yeah, I, I like I like Are We Cool Yet, and by extension, I also like Gamers Against Weed, because Gamers Against Weed are a bunch of fucking internet trolls with magic powers. You know what? I actually can't. Uh, I actually I actually can't describe it any better than that. We're just gonna leave it to that. Yep, pretty much. But then you have some interesting uh, organizations. Like the aforementioned Anderson Robotics, whose entire shtick was, let's make realistic robots. That pretty much... But then you have the Chaos Insurgency, which is just a rogue group of the SCP Foundation who don't think their methods are extreme! And The aforementioned Global Occult Coalition through Division P, so the Russian Paranormal Investigation Branch. 
But then you get into the really diabolical shit, like Marshall Carter and Dark. Yeah, Marshall Carter and Dark is actually a, actually a fairly good one. Um, you know what doesn't mix? Anomalies in capitalism. But you know what people with disposable income are willing to spend obscene amounts of money on? Literally anything. Anomalies. Yep. So Marshall so Carter Marshall and Dark... Carter, yeah, you, you, you go ahead. You go ahead. Marshall called them Carter and Dark. Their entire shtick is... They're kind of this clandestine, not, you know, evil outright organization. They're they're just a you know a capitalist organization with a loose sense of morals. And their entire purpose in the world is to obtain anomalous objects and auction them off to the highest whether this be a painting that uh, has the subjects of the painting living in it and you know going about their daily lives without realizing they're in a painting or uh, mimetic agents that um, insist that the population of the world, the youth population of the world, refer to things like YOLO. Um, and they'll just find these objects and then they'll auction them off to the highest bidder, bidder. They don't care what the bidder does with them, they're just making. Making that sweet, sweet money. As such, since they are one of the largest repositories or depositories of anomalous objects outside the SCP Foundation, there's a bit of um, overlap and uh, they don't get along very, very well. Yeah. And then you've got things like, um, and this is you know, where you get into some strange, um, strange thing. Strange things. Uh, like the Serpent's Hand, which is an organization of mages. Oh yeah, they do exist. Yes, they do. Their entire shtick is, they are literally magic. Properly magic. They actually have an area referred to as, I think it's Three Portsmouths. It essentially ends up being like Hogwarts, where you go to this specific town and you go through portals. You can end up in an alternate plane where magic is everywhere. It's, it's a bit of a stretch, but it's entertaining read nonetheless. But, I mean, it just goes to show that there are, there's magic in this Lord. There's gold in them there hills. And it's I think the last one we're going to talk about today would be the Church of the Broken God. Oh, yes. So the, uh, the, the Broken God is, um, well, it's, a, it's an anomalous, o well, it's actually not, it's a bunch of anomalous objects, we think. Um, which each represent a piece of the of this machine god, this giant giant machine god that has untold capabilities and who knows what will happen if it's ever put back together. But putting it back together is exactly what the Church of the Broken God is after. They track down and take anomalous machines that they believe are parts of their god and try to combine them. Because, of course. Because, of course, they do, right. So, they, they're... They're not involved in, like, creating anomalous objects, or even really making anomalous objects more dangerous, even though they sometimes do do that by accident. But they are just a force that's out there trying to take the objects before the Foundation can. That's all. Which, by and large, all of these groups of interests are out to do that thing. That's also true. Except for maybe Serpent's Hand and Are We Cool Yet? Because they just straight up make the anomalous objects. And there's some overlap between the 
two of those groups. And there's overlap between all of them. I mean, there are times when you'll find members of the Global Coalition working with um, Church of the Broken God, so on and so forth. Right, absolutely. That is how it goes. Um, we got anything else? We get it on the MTS. Yeah, we could. So, yeah, another thing that you'll see in a, a lot in SCP articles is uh, references to mobile task forces, or MTFs, and there's a bunch of them, and they all have their own um, specialties, but mostly they're like special forces, kind of, and by special, I mean super special. Oh, yeah, and, that, and by super special, that can rain, run the gobble between we have the best toys to we are literally led by... Uh, the biblical Cain or Abel. No, that that was never a thing. That didn't happen. You were literally led by uh, a girl who can a girl with a magical camera who once work who once didn't work for the aforementioned biblical. Yes. Because that didn't happen. But Alpha 9 is a thing. Alpha 9 is a thing, yes. So, the MTFs, they all have their own individual things. And they're not necessarily like that. You know, some of them are, um, some of them are more specialized. Some of them only work with one object. And some of them specialize in a particular kind of object. Like the kink shamers. Or the Maz Hatters. Yeah, or the Maz Hatters. But by and large, all of them are highly trained and responsible and able to react to various containment breaches and situations that might require an MTF to intervene. But they have their primary missions that they were formed. My thing is, like, there are so many MTFs now. We've made an MTF. That is true. I made an MTF for that campaign, also. You made a couple of MTFs for that campaign. No, I just re I just appropriated a couple of them. I thought you I thought you said you made Chinatown. I did make Chinatown. Did you also make what uh, WTF? No. Whiskey Tango Foxtrot is an actual. Uh, there's not really any from information about them, but I did. I took the name from the wiki. Yeah. Oh, okay. But there's so many various MTFs kicking about. I mean, like we said, the aforementioned hat, Maz Hatters, which their thing is, you know, hazmat anomalous, but right. Anomalous infectious diseases. And then you've got Gamma 13, Asimov's Lawbringers, whose entire shtick is they deal with robots and robots. AIs. You don't even know. You can't deal with robots. And then, of course, you've got Red Right Hand, which is just the, I guess you could say, secret police of the Foundation. Yeah, that makes sense. The point is, there's a whole bunch of them, and more are created every day. Yup. I love IOTA 10, the damn feds, where it's just, you know, every situation where you ever see the men in black show up, and then the actual men in black. <laughs> right, right. You got Moo 13, Ghostbusters. You'll never guess what they do.
And then, of course, you've got one of the ones that the name doesn't really mean much unless you're familiar with certain cultures. You have uh, Sam. Are you saying Samsara? Yeah. I'm just gonna I'm just gonna quote this one out loud. Immortal cyborg clones created from the flesh of a dead god. Yes. Huh. And you know, as we said, the website is an interesting place to travel to. It is. It is an interesting place to travel. It's very much like uh, TV tropes in that once you just find something to catch your interest, you're, you'll be stuck on it for date. Do not accidentally click on this website that we've been linking. It is a, it is a, it is a cogito hazard. Uh, yep, yep, yes it is. It is at least a class 4 cognito hazard. You'll need at least class four memetic hazard filtering software. Okay, wait. I'm sorry. I have to. I have to click this thing. This link right here, because SCP four nine six nine is called literally jellyfish condoms. Me. Okay, you have me sold. Uh. Uh. Yeah. No, that was um. I don't know why I clicked that, because it is exactly what it says on the tin. It is literally <laughs> jellyfish condoms. <laughs> oh, God, that hurt. And the thing about this is, it goes through periods of, in, of inactivity from time to time. I mean, granted, there's people working on the site all the time, but you don't see mass edits happening constantly. But there's still things. Like, one of the things I'm going to start reading here in the next couple of weeks is they have a new lore series that's essentially based around anomalous objects that are southern gothic. Like, literally a pet cemetery in Georgia. Except the pet cemetery has a... Eastern European dictators clone corpses buried in it stretching from 1960 to 2004. Right. Or a church that was scooped up by a hurricane and is constantly traveling through the Gulf of Mexico and every week on Sunday there is an event that causes the deceased congregation of the church to rise up as skeletons and worship and then go back about their business and proceed to be skeletons as they proceed through the Gulf of Mexico. That, no, no, that's too specific. Um, too spooky? Too spooky. Too spooky. I think what I'm getting at is there's just there's something for everybody depending on how you want to go because there's your cosmic horror in this there's your creepy pastas there's your you know things that make you question what happens when your house goes bump sure but there's things that are also heartwarming and you know things of that nature like the aforementioned nine 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 and uh, organ trans yeah I, I'm good you got anything else oh, you no, really I'm, to I'm definitely we have talked about SCPs for a long time now and uh, that's that was a pretty good introduction to like the concept of the thing so I'm gonna call it good And just for those who are consistent listeners, at some point after this podcast, we will discuss what we will talk about next time based upon something we've referenced in the show. Have fun guessing what that could be. Um, I, I, I can't even guess what that could be. Well, as always, I've been Brandon. And he's been Steve, and um, thanks for listening, if, I mean, if you are. Somewhere out there, someone's listening to this. 
I doubt that. Even if it's an ancient satellite from light years off. Oh yeah, yeah. I want to I want to give a big thanks, a big shout out, big shout out to the random person who found this on my YouTube channel in the year 2025. You, you're the real VIP. All right. MVP, <laughs> you're the real MVP. Uh. Just uh, thanks for listening, everybody. Especially you, Steve. Wait. You're Steve. Especially you, Steve. Bill. Bill, who just found this video on YouTube in the year 2025. Thank you for thank you for listening. Have a good one. Bye-bye.